say, uh, if this is your first time here, maybe you've never been here before, maybe it's your first time in church, first time in church for a, in a while, uh, my name is Pastor Zach. I have the honor and the privilege of being our lead pastor here at Multiply Lake Norman. Hey, this is our first Sunday back uh, for the year. And, and every year we like to set kind of some patterns into motion. And so starting off uh, the first service of every year, there's two things that we do. The first thing that we do is we kind of unveil uh, our word of the year. And then the second thing we do is we get ready for our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, so, man, maybe you haven't been here at the beginning of the year. Let me kind of set the stage for you. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. Throughout the course of this service, I'm going to challenge you to say some silent prayers and say, Hey, God, what do you want me to fast for the next 21 days? Hey, what do you want me to pray for for the next 21 days? days. I talked to our men's group this past Thursday and the Thursday before that, kind of letting them know that it was coming. I text a few other groups. I uh, talked to our staff, and, and we're all kind of prepared for that, and we're going to dive into that uh, and kind of unveil that a little more as we go through today's service. So here we go. We're stepping into 2023. We're stepping into a new year. I've kind of given you the rhythm of Multiply Church. Again, 21 days of prayer, starting off with uh, the word of the year. But maybe you're sitting in your seat and you're thinking to yourself, hey, bud, I don't know what fasting really is. <laughs> hey, I, I didn't really grow up in the church. I've heard of the term, but I've never really dove into it. I've never really done it for myself. Or, or maybe you've done it before, but it's been years and years ago, and it, it's not a regular practice to you. So let me lay some groundwork for you. There's three questions that I always ask people when it comes to fasting, and three questions that I'll kind of pose to you guys today. The first question is this, what's the purpose of fasting? The purpose of fasting is very simple. It's to draw closer to the heart of God. That's what the purpose of fasting is. Nothing more, nothing less, to draw closer to the heart of God for your life. The second question that I start with is, hey, what's the time frame going to be? I've kind of already laid out the time frame for you guys, but the time frame for us is going to be the next 21 days starting tomorrow. So when we come back to church on the 28th, man, we're going to, the 28th, is that the 29th, we're going to break our fast together. So what's the time frame? That, that's the time frame. And then the next question that I always ask is, hey, what, what do I fast? What, what do I fast? What do I, what do I give up? For different individuals in the room, it's going to be different things for Pastor Keith Man, he's committed to doing the whole 30 uh, for the next 21 days, and he's going to get off social media. For some of y'all, when I say get off social media, like your, your stomach dropped a little bit because you're like, no, that's my life source. Not, not giving up social media. Maybe that's the thing that you should probably give up. I, I said this in first service. I said, hey, who's going to give up coffee? And it was like, no, I, I'm not. I'm not going to voluntarily give up. Co I need coffee to start my, no, you need Jesus to start your day, all right? But the, the purpose of fasting is to give up something that's going to stretch you, not to make you miserable, but the purpose of it is to be stretched. Pastor Manny, man, what he's committed to doing, he's going to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to do his devotionals, and he's given up some refined sugars and, and other things. Megan, she's doing the same thing. Megan's giving up soda and sugars. Uh, for myself, man, I'll be doing kind of a, a paleo kind of version of, of eating. I'm committed up to getting, getting up early and doing my devotions in the morning, but that's already a natural rhythm for me, so I got to pick something else that's kind of unnatural for me. So my unnatural rhythm, Jenna and I have been doing this for the past maybe two, two and a half weeks, um, but what we do at night is uh, when we get the girls to bed, I'm going to confess a little bit. Girls go to bed. We go downstairs. How many of you in the room, like you turn on Netflix or some other s form of streaming device and then you like binge? Like that's, that's me. Like I'm a binger. Like I can, that's the, pr <laughs> never mind. Don't say that. Not in my notes. Walk away from that statement. Uh, I, I binge things. So man, I can watch three, four episodes and I'm like, I got to watch the next one. You, got, you have a cliffhanger. Like, I, ha I have to see the next one. So what we've committed to doing is to setting a timer and to read and journal before we even turn on our TV. So again, it's something that's outside of your natural rhythm. But the purpose of it is to draw closer to the heart of God. And I'll dive into that a little more as we talk about fasting. But, but Pastor Manny said this uh, earlier this week when we were talking about it. He said the problem is, is that people try to eat the whole pie in one bite. And I think that's the way we approach prayer and fasting in our life. We try to do everything at one time. And you've been there. 
You start off the beginning of the year, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and you give yourself this list of things to do. A week goes by, and you're like, this is impossible. I, I, can't, I can't do this. I'll equate it to this. When I graduated from college and got a big boy job and got my, big boy, my first big boy paycheck, making a whopping $24,000 a year. Uh, but when I got that first big boy paycheck, I was like, you know what? I'm saving, half, I'm saving half of my paycheck. It's going into the savings account. A week and a half later, like I'm transferring savings back to checking. <laughs> so I get, but you've been there, right? It's like, I'm going to put half of my, no, you're not. You got to pay bills and you got to eat. Like start, start out with something that's palatable. Start out with something that you can do and that you can be consistent with. Again, we're going to dive into that a little more. But, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 14 says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, the purpose is to spend intentional time with Jesus. So that's the structure of what's going on over the next 21 days. And I'm going to challenge you even more throughout the service. Now let's take a dive into our word of the year. Again, every year we come up with a, a word of the year. Last year it was generations. Uh, man, we've had crossover was a word of the year. Multiply was a word of the, uh, of, of the year. This year our word of the year is altered. So throughout the next several weeks, we'll be talking about seven different altars that I feel like everyone needs in their life. But throughout the year, you'll see this theme come up in our services. Our theme verse for the year is Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12. And it reads like this, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it and it shall not go out. Again, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at different altars throughout Scripture. If you plugged in online last week, you kind of got a sneak peek to the altars that we're going to be talking about. But I'll ask you this question. What does every altar have in common? It's a rhetorical question. I'll, I'll give you the answer. But there's three things that every altar has in common. Every altar has fire. Every altar has sacrifice. And every altar has the presence of God. You, you can't have an altar without having those three things. And I know this to be true. You can't leave an altar unaltered. If you encounter an altar of God, then your life will be changed. You can't encounter something that God has for us and walk away staying the same. So kicking off with week one, I want to talk about the altar of prayer. Today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. And we're going to take a look at, at Daniel's life. But, but before we do that, again, I've already confessed that I like to binge watch shows. And one of the shows that I've been watching uh, probably too much lately is called Alone. Has anybody seen Alone on Netflix? Okay, keep your hands raised if you're like hooked like I am. Like it's a, it's a fun show to watch. But here, here's the premise of the entire show. The premise is that 10 individuals get dropped off in the wilderness. And they have to survive alone longer than anyone else. Last person standing wins. Now, here's the thing. Like, it's, it's not like Survivor, okay? Survivor is a little odd to me because they're not really out there by themselves. It's like, there's a big camera crew, and y'all are getting a lot of crazy shots of them. Like, how do you get those shots without a camera crew being there? And then also, somebody gets hurt. It's like somebody comes out of their little trailer in the woods and like, hey, you need this, right? Or like, hey, here's a steak dinner for you if you win this challenge. I like the mustache, by the way. Good look. Uh, side note. But with this alone show... You're truly, the individuals are truly alone. They have like GoPro harnesses. They wear them on their head. They set up some tripods like with their cameras. But they are truly alone. Once the individuals drop them off and, and sail away, they have no contact with society or with humanity. Now here's another premise of the show. Again, last person standing wins half a million dollars. But they, they get a list or they can create their own list of 10 different items that they want to bring. And they can pick whatever items they want to bring. And, and many of them bring things like an axe or a saw, a tarp, a rope, a cooking pot, sleeping bag, fishing line or hooks, a gill net so they can kind of toss out and catch a lot of fish at one time. But many individuals bring what's called a pharaoh rod. Now, a pharaoh rod creates sparks and, and it lights a fire. And like any good person in the room, when I see it on TV, I go to Amazon to see if I can find it. And so, so 
Man, I got in trouble. I got in trouble this past week with this thing in my house because uh, I was on our granite countertops, like lighting fires, on, like literally in our kitchen. Jenna's like, if you want to play, go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Babe, I'm not 12. I'm a grown man. But yes, ma'am, I'll go outside. <laughs> but it's this idea that, that, that this sparrow rod, and, and what I've noticed watching the show is that, that creating fire is literally the difference between life and death. Listen, if you, don't, if you don't have fire, you, primitively, you can't, you can't survive. You can't boil the water. You can't cook the food. You can't ward off predators. So again, I got this thing, and I started playing with it a little bit. It's like, man, how does this thing work? And then all of a sudden, Damon, turn the lights off for me. Turn the lights off, because I just created fire in like 10 seconds. Look at that. Thank you for clapping. I appreciate that. We have, let me blow this out. That's getting big. Okay fire alarm don't go off I think we're good like Zach why are you why are you lighting fire like why are you lighting fire for for service don't worry about the sprinkler system uh Christmas Eve side note not in my notes Christmas Eve about 300 people in the room 300 candles lit beautiful service I did not think everybody was going to blow their candles out at the same time and they did <laughs> cloud of smoke fire alarms did not go off we're good all right this is not going to sell the fire alarm but I, I feel like this is the way we approach, we approach following Jesus. Because we expect other people to carry our fire. We expect the pastor to carry the fire for us. Well, I didn't get anything out of the sermon today because the pastor didn't bring it. No, maybe you weren't in tune to what God was trying to say. Well, I didn't get anything from the worship service today because the worship team didn't worship like I like them to. No, maybe you should create your own worship because the way I read my Bible is that I should be able to worship to anything. Why? Because I'm not worshiping the people or the music. I'm worshiping the presence of God. So, so here, here's the thing. Like we're called, we're called to carry our own fire. This is what I've found out is that for many Christ followers, again, they expect people to carry it for them. They expect the pastor. They expect the worship team. They expect their church. They expect their small group. They expect their spouse. They expect somebody else to carry the fire for them. But the way that I read scripture and the way that I interpret it is this, is that we're all called to have our own personal relationship with Jesus, and that constitutes us carrying our own fire. I'm going to be referencing this pharaoh rod over the next few weeks. And yeah, it's fun to, to start a little fire, but, but what does this really mean in your life? What does carrying the presence and the fire of God for you in your own life truly represent? And this is what I've, I've come to find out following Jesus and, and being around people, being involved in the church or outside the church, is that fire is not an accessory to your relationship with God. Fire is absolutely a necessity to your relationship with God. And too many people are treating fire as an accessory, not a necessity. Too many individuals are following Jesus and just kind of adding Jesus to their life. One of the episodes that I watched uh, on this show called Alone there's this individual, and he has a pharaoh rod, and, and he kind of moves his camp, and, and he, he loses his pharaoh rod. So he loses his ability to make fire. Like, inevitably, that would be me. And here's the problem. I would, I would want to call someone, that someone being my spouse, and I want to say, hey, babe, where did I put the... The problem is, the dude was alone. He's responsible for 10 different items, and he loses one. Every husband in the room is like dropping their head. It's like, I lose my keys every day. I lose my phone every day. I do it too. And I'm like, hey, babe, can you tell me where am I? And then she'll inevitably tell me whatever I'm looking for, whatever it is. But if I was in the wilderness alone, I couldn't just call Jenna and go, hey, babe, where did I put my pharaoh rod? But we almost rely on other people to tell us how to get the fire. We rely on other people to keep track of things for us in our life opposed to keeping track of it on our own. Zach, what are you relating that to? Maybe your spiritual life. Well, nobody has challenged me lately. Well, nobody has called me to ask me how I'm doing. Well, nobody has checked up on me spiritually. Yeah, but are you doing it yourself? Are you feeding yourself? Are you staying in tune with Jesus yourself? Or are you always relying on another outlet? Listen, I can't expect someone else to bring the fire for me. I have to bring it on my own. I can't rely on other people's relationship with Jesus. I have to have one myself. Newsflash, I can't rely on what God brought me in 2022. I have to look forward to what God's bringing me this year. 
Too many people want to live off of what's in the past. Too many people want to look back and go, well, I remember the good old days. Well, I remember when God, I remember when my marriage, I remember when my kids, I remember when my spouse, I remember when my family, I remember when whatever's going, I remember when it was good. Yet we can remember those things. But God didn't leave you or forsake you. He didn't give up on you. So look forward to what's to come. Maybe you're in a tough season right now. That's okay. Keep grinding. Keep hustling. Bring your own fire. Bring your own presence. Spend time with Jesus. What I've come to learn is that we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we desperate for the fire of God to be a necessity in our lives? Or are we content with it being an accessory? Man, our modern way of doing church can turn the fire of God from an excess or turn it into an accessory rather than a necessity. What, what I'm finding is that church can become optional for people. Church can become absolutely optional. One of my favorite conversations, a brief conversation, one of my favorite conversations that I had this past week uh, was with Grace Ward, wherever you are. I thought I saw you. There she is. Uh, we were at the pickleball courts and uh, go pickleball, shameless plug. But we were at the pickleball courts and uh, I was like, Grace, like, how, how's break been? How's Christmas been? How's New Year's been? She's like, oh, it was great. We, I love to relax. I love to recharge. But she was talking with her mom, and they realized that they miss seeing people at church. I'm kind of paraphrasing the conversation a little bit. But I think there's something inside of us that are drawn to other people. I've missed seeing you guys. Yes, I've loved vacation. Yes, I've loved spending time with my family. But, man, I have absolutely missed this. Not because I'm the dude on stage with the mic, but because I miss the conversations that I have in the lobby. I, I miss asking people how their lives are going. Like, I was texting Alex, I'm going to call you Alex, um, I didn't ask you if I could share the story, but I was texting Alex, and I texted Alex for like three days, and I didn't get a response from Alex. So then I messaged his wife, and I was like, is your husband alive? <laughs> He's like, oh man, I'm sorry. But, but like, honestly, like, I, missed, I miss seeing people, I miss the conversations, I miss the interactions with individuals. Church can almost become an option to where we feel like, I don't know if I need it, but when I feel like I need it, I'm going to drop in anyway. Church can become ornamental, something that we do just to check the box. Church can become even a luxury. Parents are in the room, oh, I get to drop my kid off for an hour, and I'm just going to relax without kids running around me. It's almost how we treat church sometimes. We start to take these things for granted. Think about how fire has transitioned over centuries. Something that was supposed to be so primal. Something that was used for cooking, for warmth, for keeping predators away has now become ornamental. Case in point, my living room. My wife wanted a fire in our living room. The problem is we don't have a chimney. So what did we do? We bought an electric one. Thank you for laughing at that. But we bought this electric fireplace. I'll be honest with you, we can't cook on that thing. It's not going to ward off any predators and to get any heat from it, you got to stand like three feet from it, right? If, you, if you're too far back, and you will find my wife standing there like this, getting, getting her hands. She puts her feet up. Feet are cold. Something that used to be so primal, something that was an absolute necessity has now become an accessory. I said this during first service as well. Keith, you made a beautiful Christmas fire. We were all taking pictures. You do have a chimney. You have like a legit fireplace. But it was even ornamental for us. We used it for a little warmth, but we didn't cook on it. We weren't warding off any predators with the fire. It was just there, and it made a really cool picture. Some of y'all are like, well, I make fires outside. Yeah, you make fires for s'mores outside. It's not like you're using it to cook on every single day. But we do that at our house. Like, we'll make a bonfire. We'll make some s'mores. You know, we'll invite people over. But again, we treat it as an accessory to our life opposed to something that's a necessity. In the wild, fire is literally the difference between life and death. And as Christ followers, we have to return to that type of hunger for the fire of God. Remember one of the three elements that remain the same in every single altar, and one of those is fire. Listen, if you don't have it, you will absolutely die without it. The center of all we do and all of who we are revolves around our hunger for the fire of God in our lives. Over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at seven different types of altars. And the first altar that we're going to talk about today is an altar of prayer. So an altar of prayer, if you're taking notes, jot that down. Again, we'll be in Daniel chapter 6. Let me give you some background. Daniel grew up in Jerusalem. But one day, Daniel woke up in Babylon because everyone in Jerusalem had been taken captive. 
Now, Jerusalem was known as the city of God. Jerusalem was known as a city of peace. In Jerusalem, the temple was central to every way of life that surrounded the community. Now, don't get me wrong. Not everyone followed God in Jerusalem. In fact, they were far from it. But, but all life was centered around the idea of God. Kids were taught about God in schools. That's a noble concept. People went to the temple for a day-to-day interaction. The holidays that were celebrated were religious holidays. There was this form of common morality. Laws were even based on the word of God. So Daniel goes to sleep one night in Jerusalem. He wakes up the next day and he's taken captive and taken to Babylon. Now what did Babylon represent? Babylon had no regard for the laws of God. Evil and wickedness were not only tolerated in Babylon, they were actually celebrated. The more evil and wicked you were, the more you were celebrated. Wrong was called right, and right was called wrong in Babylon. And the religious freedoms that Daniel had in Jerusalem, he didn't necessarily have in Babylon. But in the midst of all this confusion, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of captivity, God placed Daniel in a role in government. Remember back to our series that we did last year. If you weren't here, I'm going to point to this imaginary wheel. But we had seven gates, and one of the gates was the gate of government. And what we see in the book of Daniel is that God places Daniel in a high place in government. Even in Babylon, God will appoint individuals to the gate of government, and because Daniel proved himself more capable than all the other administrators. And what we found is that through reading scripture, everyone that Daniel interacted with, they actually got jealous of him. Everyone that Daniel interacted with, they actually were finding a way to pull him down. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 reads like this He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Hey, you want to know how you're a witness in your job, in your workplace? You want to know how you're a witness in your community? You want to know how you're a witness outside the four walls of the church? You're you're called to be faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. Man, if you can do those three things, then you will be a witness for who God has called you to be in our community. But drop down to verse 8. Again, the individuals that were with Daniel, the other administrators, they got a little jealous. And so they decide to go to King Darius, and they say, hey, king, hey, you're, you're a good king. You're an honest king. You're a noble king, but this is what we think you should do. For the next 30 days, we think that you should put in an ordinance that no one can pray to anything or any entity other than you. And the king, being full of pride, scripture says, hey, yeah, he thought that was a good idea, and he signed it into law. And verse 10 reads like this, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done. Why do we put an emphasis on prayer every single year? Because we need more generations of Daniels. We need people who will do more than just talk about it or get mad about it. We need people in the church that are going to do something about it and act in prayer. Man, too too often in our society, again, we'll look back to the good old days. We'll look back to what was and we'll complain. Opposed to saying, you know what, I'm going to pray. What if we actually turned our complaining into prayer? So when I talk about fasting, when I talk about giving something up, again, the purpose is to draw closer to the heart of God. Hey, maybe you are giving up coffee. Somebody's like, stop saying that. Get behind me, Satan, right? (laughs) But maybe you are giving up coffee, and the purpose of that is, man, every time you're craving that coffee, every time you're craving that caffeine, what do you do? You pause and say, you know what? Hey, Lord, man, I got this craving right now. But more than that, man, would you give me, would you give me eyes to see like you see? God, would you, give me, would you give me ears to hear like you hear? God, would my actions be your actions? Sure, God, I want, I want coffee, but that's not the most important thing in my life. You're, you're called to be the most important thing in my life. Would you help me keep you at the center of all that I do? Now, what if our lives transitioned and shifted 
that way. What does it look like to build an altar of prayer? The first thing is this. When we build an altar of prayer, when we pray as usual, it brings God's unusual. Let me read verse 10 again. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done. What does your as usual prayer life look like? Because we, we have the wish list. God, would you help me? God, would you do this? But what does your as usual prayer life with God truly look like? Fast forward in the story. Daniel prayed. The king was, a, was forced to arrest Daniel and to throw him in the lion's den. Everybody wants God to show up in the lion's den. If I'm ever thrown, up in a lion, thrown in a lion's den, I hope God shows up. But think about more practical ways that you and I deal with this situation. It's like you lose your job or your job isn't going the way that you wanted it to, and you pray for God to show up in the middle of that situation. Your marriage is on the rocks. You pray for God to show up in that situation. You get a bad doctor's report. You pray for God to show up in that situation. Your finances aren't where you want them to be. You pray for God to show up in that situation, and God wants to show up in your life. But what does your as-usual prayer life look like? Is your as-usual just trying to get a transaction from God, or is your as-usual actually spending time connecting to the heart of the Father? Man, I've been, I've been guilty of it. I've been guilty of the transactional prayers, especially when I was in college. God, if you answer this prayer for me, I promise I'll never do that again. Some of y'all are chuckling because y'all pray those same prayers. Try to barter with God. What if, what if this year we didn't barter with God, but we leaned into the heart of God? Well, what if we weren't bartering? God, will you do this for me? And if you do this, then I will do. Hey, God, I just want to know your heart. Again, God, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear, give me words to speak, that I might be able to draw closer to your heart. What does your as usual prayer life look like? What I know is that there's power in habit and there's power in ordinary. Hey, if you're looking for a good book to read, uh, kick off the uh, beginning of the year, uh, one book. I've got all the books that I'm going to mention up here. Feel free to come up and, and take a picture of them. They're going to put them on the screen here in a second. But one of the books that, that I've read through before is called Chop Wood, Carry Water by Joshua Medcalf. Not a spiritual book. It's not like a, a, a church book. But it, it, it's kind of like a, I would relate it to like a karate kid book. Meaning you walk through this story of, of someone learning to wax on and wax off before they fight. But it, it's this idea of doing the ordinary unordinarily well. How, how do you learn to do the ordinary things in your life unordinarily well? Man, the ordinary things in your life, you know what it should look like? Spending time with Jesus. How do you learn to do that unordinarily well? You know what ordinary should be in our lives? Prayer. But how do we learn to do that unordinarily well? You know what should be ordinary in our life? Taking care of others. But how do we learn to do that unordinarily well? That's the whole premise of the book, doing the ordinary things in life unordinarily well. It's the ordinary prayer life. I'm sure not every prayer that Daniel prayed was spectacular. I'm sure that every prayer that Daniel prayed wasn't so powerful that he felt the presence of God in the room right then and there. Anybody else ever been there? Like you want your prayer life to be spectacular, and I, I want mine to be that way, but sometimes it's like, hey, God, I'm here again. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm here. It's like I almost don't know what to say. Just an ordinary conversation. Hey, God, help me today. Help me to be your witness. Help me to follow you. It's not something that's necessarily that spectacular, but it's something that becomes ordinary in my life. The Bible Project put out these stats for people who read their Bible regularly and pray. And they said this. People who read their Bible and pray regu regularly are 228% more likely to share their faith with others. People who read their Bible and pray are 231% more likely to disciple others. People who read their Bibles and pray are 407% more likely to memorize Scripture. What I know is this, all of our prayers won't be spectacular, but our prayers do bring the spectacular because it brings us into the presence of God. If you're taking notes, write this down. When, is, when and where is your as usual? 
there's three specific things that I want to give you. And the first one is this. Well, the first question I want to ask you is this. When is your time to pray? Now, listen, some of you in the room, you set your alarm clocks for 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning, and you get up and pray. Great. Others of you sleep into 7, and you get up and pray. Great. Others of you spend time with Jesus at night. Great. This is what I know to be true. Just because you get up earlier doesn't mean you're more or less spiritual than someone else. And half the room said amen. I don't have, listen, when I was in the military, I got up at 3 o'clock every single day. I'm not in the military anymore. Guess what? I can sleep until 7 if I want to. And that still makes me a grown man. And guess what? I can still spend time with Jesus at 7 o'clock. I'm seeing like some chuckles. and Everybody that wakes up before 7, you're like, no, you can't. Yes, I can. But what does it look like for you to spend time with Jesus? Don't worry about what other people are doing. We're so focused on what happens in our peripheral that we forget to focus on ourselves. Listen, if I'm focused on other people waking up and the time they're spending with Jesus, guess what? My focus is on them and not on God. I couldn't care less when people spend time with Jesus. Just spend time with Jesus. What is it for you? What's practical for you? Man, there's some people in the room, you can spend an hour, hour and a half, two hours every day with Jesus. You throw on some worship music, you read, you pray. Others of you, 15 minutes goes by and you're like, squirrel. 15 minutes goes by and you're like, I, what do I have to do today? You start, anybody else in the room like that? I'm like that. Like I got to recalibrate my brain every 10 minutes because if I get to 15, I'm lost. I'm gone. But what does it look like to spend intentional time with Jesus? What is your time to pray? Write it down. What's your time to pray? The next question that I'll ask you is what's your place to pray? Got a picture from Pastor Manny uh, yesterday. He said, hey, so i got to backtrack a little bit. Uh, Alex is helping me cut a hole in my wall underneath my stairwell so that I can have literally like a prayer closet in somewhere to kind of get away. Um, and Pastor Manny texts me. He goes, hey, you got a prayer closet. i got a prayer corner. And he took a picture of like this chair and this lamp, like an intentional place that he's going to pray. What's your place going to be? Hey, may, maybe your place, maybe you can get you a little Harry Potter bedroom underneath your steps too. Or, or may, everybody that laughed, you're, you know, we'll talk about that later. You watch Harry Potter. That was a joke. Uh, Hey, maybe your place is going to be at your kitchen table. Maybe your place is your back patio and you have a chair. Maybe your place is somewhere you drive to and you you sit by the water, you sit in the woods. I don't care where your place is, but where is your place? So what's your time? Where's your place? The last thing that I'll ask you is this. What's your method to pray? What's your method? One of the methods that I use is called the SOAP method, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. And what I do is I read the Bible through uh, in a year or I listen to it audibly. And then the idea is that as you listen or read three, four, five, six chapters at a time, you just pull out one verse, one scripture. And you say, hey, I'm going to observe this scripture. What's going on? How can I apply it to my life? And then I'm going to pray about it. I'll give you an example, one of mine from a couple days ago. Again, I'm starting off in the book of Genesis again. And, uh, so I was at Noah's Ark, and Noah releases this dove, and the dove comes back, and then Noah releases the dove again, and the dove doesn't come back. Uh, and so what I observed from that was that, hey, God will prepare things when he thinks the time is right. So how can I apply that to my li- life? Lord, when I feel like I'm on Noah's Ark, when I feel like I don't know the direction that I'm going, when I feel like I don't have a landing spot, Lord, could you just help me to be patient? Could I apply that principle to my life? And then I'd say a short prayer just to pray that in. Very simple concept. But I took it a step further for me. For me personally, I asked uh, Pastor Keith, Pastor Manny, and Josh Randalls as more of a smaller group to hold me accountable. So every Monday, we're committed to calling each other and going, hey, how how have your quiet times been? How's your time with Jesus been? And, And hey, what are you journaling about? What are you writing about? What's God speaking to you? I've said this before in church, and I'll say it again. Too often, Christ followers want to talk about all the negative stuff in life and not talk about the stuff that God's doing positively in their life. What if we flip the script a little bit, and in 23, we said, hey, let me tell you everything positive that's happening in my life. Let let me tell you where God's showing up in my life. So it's a way for us to hold each other accountable. Let me fly through these. I'm going to give you some practical tips for prayer and fasting, and then I'll land the plane. The the first tip that I want to get you for, for prayer is this. Make it simple and don't beat yourself up. Make it simple and don't beat yourself up. I told you the method, the SOAP method, scripture, observation, application, prayer, but get a journal. Write something down. One thing that, that I do every year, regardless of how many pages are left in the journal that I'm finishing, is I will com- I'll get a new journal every January. 
So I've got one that I can insert it in, insert it out. So I started one. I had about 30 pages in my old journal. Hey, new year, starting a new jam, uh, journal. Threw it in there, started writing stuff down. Every day, even if it's just a sentence, just write something down. Have a goal. Man, what do you want to obtain through the next 21 days of prayer? What are you asking God to answer? Ask someone to be your accountability partner. Man, I got, I got three guys that I know they're going to ask me hard questions. And I can trust them to ask me hard questions. And then, again, share what God is doing in your life. For fasting, let me give you some tips. Make it simple and don't beat yourself up. Too often, we, again, we get that list and we're like, I got to do this. No, make it simple. Think of the bank account. You're not going to save half of your paycheck. Put 100 bucks to the side, but be consistent with it. And don't transfer it back over, right? Be consistent. Hey, maybe you've never done a fast before. Maybe you're going to cut out soda. Maybe you're going to cut out gluten or bread. Maybe you're going to cut out sugar. Maybe you have done a smaller fast before. Maybe for you, this time, you're going to do the Daniel fast. Or maybe you're going to do the Whole30. Maybe you're going to do paleo. Maybe you're going to do something like that. Or maybe you're going to cut out social media for 21 days. Maybe you're going to cut out coffee for 21 days. What is it for you? And then I get asked this all the time. Hey, what are some good books that I could read? Go ahead and throw all of those books on there. Uh, man, if you want to take a picture of this, it's a good, good starting list. Uh, but The Beginner's Guide to Fasting by Elmer, Elmer Towns. Um, it's a good little devotional book too. Uh, God Dreams by Will Mancini. I believe that people don't step into fasting and prayer as we're called to do because you're actually nervous that God will answer your prayers. You're actually nervous that God will answer your God-sized dreams. And this book helps you kind of navigate that. A uh, Simple Prayer by Charlie Dawes. Uh, prayers don't have to be colorful or long. It's just a simple conversation with God. Chop Wood, Carry Water, I mentioned that one. And then Gentle and Lowly uh, by Dane Ortland. I'm actually probably two-thirds of the way through that book. Uh, that's the book that I'm reading at night that I kind of explain with Jenna. But what does it look like to build an altar of prayer? Got two more things. I'll do them quick. Number two, open windows of prayer bring an open heaven over cities. Think back to Daniel chapter 6 and historically what was going on. Daniel's in the middle of Babylon. He's praying towards Jerusalem. And some, listen, sometimes we need a prayer closet. Sometimes we need something secluded where we can go in and pray and get along with God. But sometimes we need a prayer window. I don't care if it's not popular in society. I don't care if it's not popular in culture. Sometimes we need to pray from the position that God has placed us in. This past week, uh, Man, there was a, a tragic incident on a football field. DeMar Hamlin was kind of pronounced dead on the football field, and they, they brought him back. But take a look at this video on what happened on national live television. Um, football gave me everything. You know, and I think even through the midst of absolute tragedy last night, I think you saw some of the beauty of football mm -hmm. as well, that it's brought us all here together. Um, you know, like... This is a little bit different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say, like, we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for It him. is. DeMar Hamlin right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar, to be with his family, to give them peace, if we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 It's beautiful. Respectfully. So here, here's my thing. That's national television. There, there's, I mean, that's something to get excited about. I mean, there's, there's been instances where, where stuff like that has happened in the past and the feed is cut off. What I loved about, I, I was watching the, the Jaguars game, uh, Jaguars play in the Titans, and before their game yesterday, both teams, entire teams, staff and everything, circled up, said, hey, you know what, we're going to pray for no more. What, what would it look like for us to have a window of prayer? Yes, Christ followers, we can have a prayer closet. We can get along, we can get a, alone with God. But what would it truly look like for us to have a window of prayer? For us to say, you know what? 
People say they're sending thoughts and prayers. That sounds good. But what if we make a declaration in 2023 that if somebody sends us a text and says, hey, would you pray for me? What if we actually call them and go, hey, can I pray right now? What, what if in 2023 when someone walks up to you and goes, man, I need prayer for this. What if you pause what you were doing and say, hey, can we pray for that right now? Right now. What if we activated our faith? What if we put it into practice? I don't want to be someone that just talks about it. You hear me say it all the time. I want to be somebody that's going to be about it. I want to be about this, I want to be about this altar of prayer. But this is what I know. You can't do it unless you're carrying your own fire. You can't do it unless you get right with God. You can't do it unless you're spending time with Jesus daily. I tell you what, uh, some of the times that that I feel like, man, I'm just equipped to do the work of God is when I'm spending time with God. If someone comes up to me, man, I got this thing going on. Hey, let's pray right now. Why? Because it's not Zach Witt. It's the Spirit working in and through me. And as long as I'm spending time with the Spirit, then we can impact, we can impact so many people. What does it look like to build an altar of prayer? The last thing is this. An open mouth of prayer closes the mouth of lions. Let me catch you up to the story in Daniel. So I told you there were, there were individuals that Daniel was, was working with, and, and they didn't like him, so they go to the king. King signed this into order, so the king does. Daniel still prays. And Darius has to arrest Daniel and throw him in the lion's den. Here's the problem. King Darius had an affinity towards Daniel. He actually liked Daniel. Scripture says that he liked it. So the night that he threw Daniel into the lion's den, Scripture tells us that, that King Darius was restless. He tossed and he turned. He couldn't sleep. And as soon as daybreak hit, he ran to the lion's den. He removed the stone and he looked down and he says, Daniel, Daniel, are you there? With just this hope that somehow Daniel survived. And in verse 22, Daniel says this, My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. In its purest form, prayer is intimacy with Jesus. And I believe that God answered Daniel's prayer because of his as usual prayers. Not because he came to him in his dire moment of need. I, I referenced this book, Simple Prayer by Charlie Dawes. It's a good friend of mine. I used to work with him um, at a university. But he writes this. He says, prayer shouldn't be seen as a mechanism to get what we want from God. It is an opportunity to recognize that God is present and to respond. The message translation puts it this way in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and blood and moved in to the neighborhood. Even with the knowledge that God is near and desires to dwell among us, it is easy to slip into a transactional mode when we pray. Listen, we all have needs that are pressing and we serve a God who is our source and supplier. But if we see prayer primarily through this lens, we trade intimacy for transaction. The invitation of Jesus is an intimate one. Intimacy says come, be known, and then get to know in exchange. Intimacy promises trust and love abounding. Intimacy is what we crave, but often our prayers seem like a wish list offered for fulfillment. Rather than seeking intimacy in prayer, we are tempted to turn prayer into a performance. Listen, what I know is prayer isn't a performance. What I know is prayer is spending time with Jesus. Praying that God would change our hearts. Not that he would just answer our prayers. At Good Drip Coffee, uh, we have a prayer wall. And over the past couple of months, there have been 144 different prayers that were written on the wall. And I've been waiting uh, for this service. And I've kind of been saving these. We took these down. And I've been saving these for this service. Because oftentimes it's hard for us to pray for something in our life. You know, that's when we get that wish list of prayer. You know, that's when we say, hey, God, would you just do this for me? God, would you do that for me? But something changes when we begin to pray for other people. And what I'm learning is that something really begins to change when we pray for people that we've never encountered. And what I know is that there are very real prayers on all of these cards. What I know is that this isn't just a prayer of someone across the globe. This is a prayer of someone down the street. 
So if we want to talk about changing our community, if we want to talk about changing our immediate family, if we want to talk about changing the area in which we live, what if we started with prayers of real people that wrote this desperately on a wall? I said, I don't, I don't know what I, I read through these. I don't know which one you're going to grab. But as Jenna and I were kind of looking at these and, and, and making sure that none of them were too crazy, like, <laughs> some of them were crazy. It's like we almost started getting emotional. Some of them don't even have names on them. And you start reading their prayers and you start feeling them. You know what I think that is? I think that's a spirit inside of us crying out going, I want to answer these. I, I, want, I think God cries out through us and says, you know what? I want these people to experience the love and the grace and the forgiveness that only Jesus can bring. So again, we're not going to be a church that just talks about it. But we're going to be a church that's going to be about it. I've challenged you with a couple things today. I've challenged you to ask God what you should fast for the next 21 days. I've challenged you to spend the next 21 days in prayer that you would have a time, you would have a place, and you would have a method. But this is also what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to challenge you to start now. I'm going to challenge you to activate your faith. This is my hope and my prayer, that there wouldn't be a card left up here after the end of this service. My prayer is that individuals would leave their seats, they would grab a couple cards, and they would keep those cards with them over the next 21 days. And as you're going through your own life, that you would also pray for someone else. So could we all begin to activate our faith and turn this place into an altar of prayer? Hey, thanks for joining us today at Multiply Church. We can't wait to see you again next week, either in person or online, as we continue to love Jesus and change the world.